So moving on to the next um, slide, just to tell you what the objectives of this um, paper are. Really to have a look at some ideas of how ethnicity is currently influencing both our discourse around internal trafficking and also service responses because of that. To look at what seems to me um, a current hierarchy of vulnerability that exists in the UK about how we define children and young people as being vulnerable. And then finally, but the most importantly, to look at ways that practitioners can manage some of these complex issues in their practice. So to do this, I need to begin by defining internal trafficking, because it's not straightforward in um, the United Kingdom. So the inclusion of internal trafficking is not explicit in um, policy definitions of child trafficking in the UK. And this stands in stark contrast to other countries, particularly um, to the US, where a clear link is made between internal trafficking and what we in the UK often call child sexual exploitation. So the UK has adopted the Palermo Protocol definition of child trafficking, and that's what you would see in uh, government documents, etc. However, definitions of internal trafficking vary quite considerably. However, they generally encompass the idea of movement and exploitation, or the intent to exploit, within the United Kingdom. This in itself is controversial, as according to the US government, human trafficking can include, but does not require, movement. However, in the UK, movement is seen as one of the two necessary preconditions to determine whether or not a child is a victim of trafficking. CEOP, so that's the Child Exploitation Online Protection Centre, questions whether this is helpful, whether this focus on movement is helpful, um, given that it focuses our attention on movement rather than whether or not the child has been exploited or abused. According to Jenny Pierce, who's an academic at the University of Bedfordshire, further definitional variations exist which are based on the geographical area in which a social worker is practicing. So what she found in her research is that social workers that practice in areas that are near to either airports or seaports could make a clear distinction between um, internal trafficking of separated children and um, the child sexual exploitation of citizen children. However, um, most other social workers and most other professionals that work with vulnerable children are, are not able to make those kinds of distinction. So what we have is confusion, and this confusion perpetuates and as a result, much of what would be described as internal trafficking is known by a variety of terms here in the UK. I'm going to talk just a bit more about this because it's um, quite critical to this argument, really. So um, in the mid-2000s, around 2006, um, a number of organisations started to make a case for saying, well, actually, child sexual exploitation, what's going on, is the same as internal trafficking. And if you wanted to look at uh, those early papers, you could look at the work of CROP in 2006, which is an organisation that supports parents whose children have been internally trafficked, and also the work of the Sheffield um, Local Safeguarding Children's Board was quite pivotal in this. And these organisations were basically saying, um, were arguing that child sexual exploitation should be considered internal trafficking in, in the UK. First of all, because, um, because there was such an interest in child trafficking, it was sidelining funding for CSE projects, child sexual exploitation projects. Secondly, it was claimed that the police were not responding to call outs about young girls, citizen children that were being sexually exploited, but they were responding to um, concerns around internal trafficking. And thirdly, and I think this is the most significant, new patterns of child sexual exploitation were beginning to emerge at that point, involving a number of young girls being moved short distances to be sexually exploited by a network of offenders. This pattern is now recognised as internal trafficking, that is the movement of citizen as well as separated children within UK borders for the purposes of sexual exploitation. It is important to acknowledge that many children from abroad are trafficked into the UK and will also be moved around the country, um, as well as what we see with citizen children. 
Bernardo's, which is one of the leading organisations that works with children that have been sexually exploited in the UK, has adapted its triad model of child sexual exploitation to take into account these new understandings of internal trafficking for sexual exploitation. So Bernardo's define networked and organised child sexual exploitation as child trafficking. So they make a distinction between this and some of the other models of um, child sexual exploitation that we know exist, such as inappropriate relationships or what's often known as the boyfriend model. So just to summarise, for the purposes of the rest of this paper, I'm using um, internal trafficking to mean, as you can see on the slide, the forced movement of all children and young people for any form of exploitation, although my particular interest is child sexual exploitation. So moving on. Sorry, I'm just uh, getting used to doing all of these things online. Um, the Rochdale case. It, this case has been very significant in the United Kingdom. Um, so in May 2012, nine men received convictions for a variety of offences related to sexual exploitation and the trafficking of children, including rape, conspiracy to engage a child in sexual activity. Notably, some of these men were also charged with the offence of internal trafficking under Section 58 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. Seven child victims out of a total of at least 45 identified victims came forward to give evidence that could be used in um, a court. Their evidence talked of being repeatedly sexually abused in takeaway restaurants and in flats and in taxis. The men, the perpetrators who were convicted of these crimes, lived in Rochdale and Oldham, which are areas that surround the city of Manchester and form part of a metropolitan borough. Some of the men are married, some are working, and they ranged in age from 22 to 59 years old. The majority are UK citizens, however, two of the men are going to be deported to their country of origin once they've served their sentences in the UK. The victims, as we know, were white British females aged between 13 and 17. Many commentators made public statements at the time that the men were convicted that there was a racial dimension to this case. To date, there is not an evidence base, there's no research evidence base to support this assertion. Evidence from the few studies on internal trafficking in the UK suggests a very mixed picture in relation to the ethnicity of both the victims and the perpetrators. Victims are from a range of ethnic backgrounds with trends tending to reflect the demographics of the area in which the victim lives. And that's a very key point that I'm going to come back to. CEOP in 2011 found uh, victims were from a range of ethnicities, excuse me, ethnicities, although the majority were white. So out of the identified number they had of 2,083, um, they found that 61% of the victims um, were classed or identified as white, 33% um, unknown, 3% Asian and 1% black. However, there may be a number of reasons that the reported number of victims from ethnic minorities is so low. Um, it is well established that there are additional barriers for BME young people to reporting um, issues and concerns around sexual exploitation. The first of those barriers is that often services are perceived as being institutionally racist. And the second major barrier is that there's often community pressure as well to keep any form of sexual abuse hidden. Um, there is also the concern around not wanting to shame and dishonor the community. And um, the Muslim women Network in the UK has just produced a really excellent report that looks and explores some of these issues in uh, greater depth. So when we look at the ethnicity of perpetrators, um, here we're looking at perpetrators who are a part of a organized network or gang. And again, they represent a number of ethnic groups. So in the United Kingdom, ethnicity is recorded using the classification scheme of the Office for National Statistics, which is a government agency.
Unfortunately, um, the data that's collected by statutory agencies, just as such as the police or children's social care, um, is rarely accurate to the degree that we actually need to measure um, these important issues around ethnicity. Uh, so basically, local authority statistics can often be wrong. So bearing that in mind that we have quite a lot of potentially flawed data, um, what SEAL in 2011 found were that a number of Asian men were being identified as being involved in internal trafficking, and that that number was much higher at 28% than their overall rate in the UK population, which in 2009 was thought to be 5.9%. Cobain and Braley did some interesting research uh, looking at uh, network analysis in relation to uh, perpetrators of internal trafficking in the UK. And they found in their study that of the 52 suspects charged with on-street offending, 83% were Asian Pakistani and 11% were Asian other. Now that is just one study and clearly it merits further research. Um, the limited amount of data suggests a disproportionate involvement of Asian males in a very specific type of offending behaviour. However, and I think this is really critical, um, the, the data obtained by Cobain and Braley does reflect a very particular demographic in that it reflects a particular local area. And it could well be that if the research had been done in another area, the findings would be completely different. I think another really important point is why is it that we have um, this level of degree in fascination around this information in relation to perpetrators um, who sexually exploit citizen children, and yet we seem to be far less interested or far less knowledgeable about um, perpetrators of children who have come from other countries and are trafficked into this country and then trafficked within this country. So issues of race do not seem to permeate in the same way when we're looking at uh, separated children. So I think it's fair to summarise and say that the high media profile of the Rochdale case is not simply based on the nature of the crime that was committed. In this case, the initial media focus illustrated that race in the UK continues to be a factor that will push a story up the news agenda. Um, and this is indeed the case in a post 9-11 world with stories that can somehow be linked in some way or another, however tenuously, with allegedly Islamic cultural values. And that's what we saw in the media presentations at the time. It stands really in stark contrast to recent cases. So there was a case in Derby involving a group of white men who sexually exploited young white girls, and that was only very briefly reported on in the um, news. And then again, more recently, there's been a conviction of a member of a gang for offences against Asian girls. And again, um, that really received no media attention at all and was presented as a footnote um, in one newspaper. The publication just one month ago of the report from the Muslim Women's Network called Unheard Voices um, draws on 35 case studies where they show very clearly that um, Asian young girls are also likely to be subject to sexual exploitation and internal trafficking. And it's an important report in that it reminds us that there is a whole group of young people that until very recently we did not know or did not ask questions about. It's interesting as well that their findings in the main in that report are that um, Asian young girls tend to be internally trafficked or subject to sexual exploitation by members of their own community. However, in Rochdale, the assertion was, as we can see in this first quote from the Manchester Evening News, that the girls were targeted because of their ethnicity. Um, as we've discussed, there's little, if any, factual evidence um, that can actually support this claim. With daily reports of the trial, the emphasis was on how the grooming process was carried out. There was almost a salacious interest in um, the exploitation itself and the nature of the trafficking that took place. Um, so what we saw was a 
an unnecessary uh, focus on issues of ethnicity and race in this case, rather than the vulnerability of the young people themselves. Mary Doyle, who's the Detective Chief Superintendent at Greater Manchester Police, um, is very clear during her investigations of this case that these young girls were not targeted because they were white. Um, they were targeted because they were there, i.e. they were vulnerable because they were there at night hanging around outside. Um, and as a result, they came into contact with men who were working in the nighttime economy in Rochdale, taxi drivers or men working in takeaways. So their paths crossed in that way. So this idea of um, both chance and location, I think, are really important in what has taken place. All of this stands um, in stark contrast, really, to our responses to separated children. And when I talk about separated children, I'm talking about children from abroad who are currently in the UK without a primary caregiver. There hasn't been a lot of work so far on the similarities and differences in the patterns of internal trafficking between these two groups. One of the key differences is this focus on ethnicity um, that we've already been looking at during this um, last 20 minutes. So if we look at what do we know about citizen children who are internally trafficked within the UK, um, we know that they can come from all nationalities um, within the UK so that um, black and minority ethnic children are also subject to internal trafficking. We certainly know that a lot of internal trafficking involving uh, citizen children takes place with on a regional basis, so in the north of England or in the south of England, um, and that, that seems to be quite a key and important feature of it. We also know that um, despite the, the popular myth, most young people who are internally trafficked, who are citizen children, are not likely to be looked after children. In fact, they're far more likely to be living at home. And that's actually quite a distinct pattern in their experiences of exploitation. Often they will be picked up from their home address by the perpetrators and returned either later that night or sometimes um, a day or so later. So they'll be drop back at the home address. And generally, the evidence seems to indicate that citizen children are only internally trafficked for child sexual exploitation. When we think about it in relation to separated children, the picture is really very different. So often these children will either have been smuggled into the UK or trafficked into the UK. And then once they're here, they might be moved many times within the UK and again, what the research that's been done so far would suggest that that movement has um, quite a different format so that we're looking at young people being moved across the four nations, so England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, they're not likely to go to one place and then back again and then return again, um, but they're being moved continuously to different destinations um, within the country. So that's a very different pattern. Most of these children, um, if they've had any contact with statutory services, will technically be looked after children, and many of them will go permanently missing from uh, the local authority care system. EPAC UK, amongst other organisations, has done some really significant work in showing us how many separated children go missing in the UK, and the fact that most of them will be internally trafficked as part of that process of going missing. And also, the other distinctive feature, really, is that um, for separated children, what we know is that they're likely to be um, experience a range of exploitative experiences. So they will not just be moved for sexual exploitation, but they might be doing forced labor, domestic servitude. So there'll be multiple layers of abuse and exploitation taking place. It is very striking when you compare the media responses to cases like Rochdale compared to when, and it's not very often, um, that stories hit the news about separated children being sexually exploited in the UK. 
this difference in focus sorry excuse me I'm just rattling my papers around um, I think represents a number of um, real tensions in um, current service provision and also a real uncertainty about what our responses should be to separated children. So we know that often separated children receive a differential service from citizen children and often a second rate service and I think that's well established in the research. So child victims of trafficking from abroad will find themselves often being dealt with as immigration offenders. Nobody will follow them up if they go permanently missing. Their cases will be closed even though they looked after children. Often they'll have been sent to unsafe accommodation. Um, and sometimes agencies that are charged with their protection still don't believe their stories. So this is clearly a very vulnerable group, and yet the idea, the notion that this group of children is vulnerable is really not obvious from um, the responses of state services or from the media, because our focus is far much more on citizen children. A great deal was made of the vulnerability of the girls in the Rochdale case, although again this has a number of layers to it that really need to be unpicked. So what we're beginning to see is there's some kind of um, hierarchy operating here about who we're prepared to deem as vulnerable and why we're prepared to say they're vulnerable. So in relation to Rochdale, these girls were deemed vulnerable um, and the local authority was held as being responsible for a failure to care for them. However, the evidence is really very mixed in relation to the Rochdale case. Out of the 45 girls that were ultimately exploited, um, 50% were known to social services, however, very few of them were actually in local authority care at the time, although a third of them had been in care previously, and this um, detail came out with the Office of the Children's Commissioner's report in 2012. The media spent much time focusing on the vulnerability of these girls and that they'd been targeted because they were white. But there were also other discourses going on. At one point, these girls were described as white, working class, and then, and I quote, from chaotic and council estate backgrounds. So a different kind of myth around these young people was being established. The idea that these young people had been abandoned by their families and even by society was also pursued by the criminal defence team, who noted that these young people were perceived to be unwanted, unloved, they were on the streets late and nobody seemed to care about them. So at points the victims were often portrayed in very negative stereotypical terms as being out of control or as somehow complicit in the exploitation that took place. And I think it's very welcome today the announcements that we've seen from Kira Stam um, announcing immediately a change um, to focus in cases that get to court around uh, child abuse and sexual exploitation. And a whole set of myths, including some of the ones we've touched on today, have been debunked and it's been made clear that these can no longer um, lead um, defence teams as they um, do their work and I think that's a very very welcome development today. So if we think about it in relation to vulnerability and this is one of the things that has interested me. Um, when I think about these young people whether they're um, citizen children, the young girls from Rochdale or whether they are children from abroad um, I think about their vulnerability in three ways, and the three interconnect, they can't really be separated. And the first is that they're vulnerable because of the risky situations they find themselves in. Now that risky situation could be arriving alone in this country without a primary caregiver and having a number uh, with you that you need to phone um, and then being caught into the world of trafficking in this country. Equally risky is hanging out late at night, um, unsupervised, um, in areas, in towns, etc. that we see so often. So we've got risky situations here and it's really important that we focus on the situation as being risky rather than the young people themselves as being demonstrating risky behaviours. <clears throat> 
So um, Nigel Partners argued that we sh um, if we focus on risky individuals, um, basically we um, have the potential to miss what can occur in risky situations. And this is a really prime example of that. Um, the second vulnerability factor is the fact that young people are preyed on and exploited by perpetrators and um, that cuts across any discussion of ethnicity. It's about the grooming process that takes place quite rapidly and how perpetrators very deliberately draw young people in um, to these situations. And often they do so because they're manipulating young people's hopes and dreams. And whether that's a dream of a better life, coming to the UK and having a better life here, if that's the dream, or whether the dream is of being the most popular young person at school, and that's achieved by getting into a flashy car at night uh, and being seen to hang around with much older men. Whatever those things are, they're being manipulated very explicitly and very clearly by the perpetrators who know exactly what they're doing. So really, I think we need to focus our um, activities and our efforts on uh, thinking about these vulnerability factors, the factors that are really less about the young people themselves and more about the society in which we currently live. And if we did that, I think that we would possibly be thinking less about race as some alleged causal factor of child sexual exploitation. There is a huge amount of guidance available for practitioners about how to um, improve and develop practice around this area of child sexual exploitation. And sometimes that guidance becomes so complicated it becomes meaningless. What I'd like to say is, I suppose in addition to the well-established and recognised um, risk indicators that um, have been developed by Jenny Pierce, by Bernardo's, um, and by ECPAC UK, if you're thinking of separated children. I think it's often really important to ground ourselves when we're thinking about young people and vulnerability and think about them in terms of their age and stage. Where are they up to in their um, development and how does that make them developmentally vulnerable? Um, these are often young people we're dealing with who are in a transition phase and the Groomers will absolutely pick on that, that transition and manipulate it to its maximum effect. And I think it's interesting that whilst in some areas we can talk endlessly about ethnicity as being potentially an issue here, really um, it cuts across the board. We know that white men will offend against um, males and females of all ethnicities and we also know that other ethnicities will offend against um, other children. The evidence base is, is slowly emerging and it probably will emerge over the years but we know that that's the case now. What is a key and, and often what's um, ignored apart from the voluntary agencies that work very well with um, young people who have been sexually exploited is that um, it takes a long time for young people to trust um, people they're working with and people who are trying to pull them out of these situations. And so young people may well fear confiding in you, whether or not um, they're from this country or from any other country. That fear is likely to be very real, to be very genuine. It will need a huge amount of time to um, work with them and encourage them to uh, trust in you. And I guess what we know from the agencies that can give young people that time, which of course is best practice, is that what happens is it often does lead to a disclosure. And particularly in these cases of networked offending, that can then lead to other young people being protected and potentially more than one vict um, sorry, more than one perpetrator being convicted. So it is worth taking that time. Although clearly that's a challenge in many statutory services. So to summarise, I'd just like to say that we have focused too much really on ethnicity. It is, there are areas of practice, there are, this is an area that it has some interest, but I think we need to understand a lot more about what makes 
some of our young people so vulnerable and what can we do to um, protect them and to limit that vulnerability and um, enable them to see the situation uh, for what it is rather than being groomed into sexual exploitation.